before I get started, I want to give a shout out to Inu Blue, Iceberg G85, and Asher Primus for their support of the channel, and to Zabar Cole for the $20 donation. Hallelujah! And if you'd like to support the channel directly, Cash App and PayPal are available. Just let me know in the for section if it's okay for me to thank you publicly, or else I'll assume you'll want to remain anonymous. And here we go. Layman's Journal, Chapter 220. Three years ago, a condescending hit piece was published in Screen Rant titled, Manga Has Always Been Political, Western Readers Never Realized It. It was directed towards those of us who have an issue with all of the DEI-inspired messaging and progressive propaganda found in today's entertainment media, specifically in films produced by Marvel Studios and Lucasfilms, who are both Disney properties. And in it, the writer argues manga, and by proxy anime, is just as woke as American entertainment media, that it's no different than the MCU or Star Wars. It was an attempt to discredit our contempt for Hollywood by making us look like ill-informed hypocrites, as many of us prefer anime and manga to American entertainment media. But it was also an attempt to muddy the waters, to graft manga and anime into the same category as Hollywood. So it wasn't just a hit on us, it was an attack on Japan as well. Now I'm not going to quote the article because if I quote it, I'll have to respond to every claim he makes because it's full of lies, half-truths, and panels posted without context. And because it's sort of a dead issue as other content creators with platforms much larger than mine have masterfully responded to it, again, it happened three years ago, I'm too late to the party and I can't say anything about it that has not already been said. But the reason why I bring that up is because I believe that article was a prophecy or warning of what was going to come. I've always thought with the rise in popularity of anime, at some point, you'd have companies in the West that would try to emulate the genre, that would blur the lines between what is and what isn't real anime. And never has that been more abundantly clear than when I watched Blue-Eyed Samurai. Initially, it was a show I didn't plan on viewing, but the reason that I took interest in it is because a lot of people kept asking me my thoughts on it, assuming that I've seen it or that I would like to see it. And after months of avoiding it, I've watched the first season, and I've got some thoughts on it. So, let's get it. First, let me say, and I want to make this extremely clear, this show is not, I repeat, not anime. Now, for all the anal retentive people out there who like to play semantics, yes, I know, it's animated, and that anime is short for animation. But when you use that word anime, you're talking about something that comes out of Japan, a project that is written and produced by Japanese artists, which is often an extension and celebration of Japanese culture. Blue-Eyed Samurai is none of the above. It's to anime what Vanilla Ice is to hip-hop, what Color Me Bad is to R&B, what Taylor Swift is to swag surfing, what Travis Kelsey is to The Fade. His haircut is the top request at barbershops across the country. The buzz cut even has its own name. It's called, what else, the Travis Kelsey. You can't be serious. It's a poser, something that dominant culture has chosen to represent anime. So what nobody gonna tell me what go down in the anime. Yo, watch Blue Eyes Samurai, watch Blue Eyes Samurai. I'm like, okay. It's not what you're expecting from a Netflix anime. This is not a show for kids, this is an adult anime. See what I mean? And we'll talk about that later because I first wanna talk about what the show does well. First, let me say it's a masterfully produced show. It's very well written, well cast, directed, and animated. And I'd be lying if I told you that I didn't enjoy it immensely, when the fact of the matter is I did. I absolutely did. Starting with the animation, it looks like a high-quality stop-motion comic book. Every frame looks like a panel out of a graphic novel. So it's like a book come to life. I know that sounds odd, but it's actually very beautiful, as are the action sequences. I don't know how much time was spent, but a lot of detail went into every sequence. My favorite being when Mizu, that's the main character, takes on the Thousand Claw Army. And while the action is stylistically done, it's grounded, it's gory, it's gritty, it's real. When Mizu fights, her goal is to delete her opponent. She's going after necks and vital organs, and if she can't get that, she's taking an extremity. 
Swing at her and miss and you'll lose a finger, a hand, an arm, maybe even an entire leg. All of her moves are intentional and none of them are wasted. And she takes a beating as well. She's not one of those silly, over-the-top MCU heroes. You know the types where everything explodes and collapses around them and they walk away with a limp, a little mud on their face, a cut over their eyebrow, and a tattered uniform. No, Mizu is injured after every battle and usually has to take off time to heal. She's like a normal person. And speaking of the characters, they're well developed. Their personalities are unique and distinct. First, there's Mizu, the main protagonist. I appreciate the fact that she's not a flawless female hero. She's not super strong, super smart, with absolute moral clarity. And while she is a highly skilled warrior and the show's protagonist, she's far from perfect. I would even go as far as to say she has villainous tendencies and doesn't consistently make the right decisions. She does some really messed up stuff in the show, but most importantly, you see her pay the consequences for the things she's done wrong. On multiple occasions, her enemies refer to her as a demon, or they talk about her dead eyes, that she has bloodlust. Then there's Princess Akimi. The show features a B story with her as the main protagonist, and her life is the polar opposite of Mizu's. She was born in the lap of luxury to a wealthy lord, and she's got rich girl problems, the biggest being not being able to choose who she wants to marry. You see, Akimi is in love with a young samurai named Taigen, who she isn't allowed to be with because he's the son of a poor fisherman. And she, being a princess, has been promised to the son of another wealthy lord. And to further complicate things, Taigen is missing. He's on a quest to regain his honor, hoping that if he succeeds, he will be a worthy candidate for marriage. And he's unaware that Akimi, the woman he loves, is betrothed to another. So this prompts Akimi to run away from home in search of Taigen. So during the show, you see both of these ladies wandering the Japanese countryside. One is out for justice, the other is looking for the man she wants to marry. After that, there's Abijah Fowler, the show's main villain. And I'm not ashamed to say he's my favorite character. He's the epitome of evil and I love it, particularly the way he's written. He gives two epic monologues in the show that are the apex of the series. But what I like most about Fowler is that he's not your standard villain. He's not bad for the sake of being bad. There's a real complexity to him, and he's a fascinating character. I thought he of all the cast was the best written, and that says a lot because they're all well written. And then there's Heisei Shindo. He's another interesting villain. He's like Tyrion Lannister meets Peter Baelish. In a world where right makes might and men dominate with brute strength, he rises to power with his mind. And he's as swarmy and untrustworthy as it gets, but he's a master of the tongue. And again, I tip my hat to the screenwriters for that. While there is a lot of woke messaging in the dialogue, and we'll talk about that in a minute, for the most part, it's well done. Now, I know I talk about that a lot, but it's a lost art in storytelling. You have to get the viewer to fall in love with the characters before you put them in danger, or else they won't care if something happens to them. But what I appreciate most is the overall narrative. It's a great story, and I love the fact that the stakes are real. Women and children are not spared because it's a story being told during an ugly time in Japan's history when people were willing to do unsavory things just to survive. So what is it about? It's the story of a young female warrior named Mizu born in the 17th century. At a time when Japan was closed off to foreign influence, no one, aside from those native to the land, were allowed inside the country. And that's significant because Mizu is biracial, with pale skin and blue eyes. She's the byproduct of a non-consensual act between her mother and four white men who took turns violating her. And to a Japanese population that had never seen white men or white people, she was ugly, deformed, a mistake of nature. And there were several attempts made on her life, the earliest being when she was a newborn. Later, her home was set on fire. And while she, Mizu, escaped, her mother didn't. And for a while, she survived by sleeping on the streets and eating garbage, while the kids in the neighborhood bullied her and beat her and chased her around with rocks and sticks. I know what you are. Your mother killed herself because your father is a white devil. But a blind man named the Swordmaker, who was a blacksmith, showed her mercy and took her in. And he taught her how to craft swords. He essentially raised her, 
while she aided him in his shop. And to further complicate Mizu's life, she was born a girl at a time when girls and women didn't have equal rights. They weren't even allowed to travel from town to town without a male chaperone. Next! This travel pass is invalid. It's my husband's. It's invalid without him. Next! He died. I make the baskets. He only sold them. Please. Or I can't feed my children. You know the rules. Women can't travel without a chaperone. Next! <laughs> travel pass. And daughters, for the most part, was seen as a burden on the family. They were often traded and sold like property to the highest bidder. Sometimes, if the girl were exceptionally beautiful or her family had status, she would be sold off to a rich family. But if the family could not afford to keep her, if no man of status wanted her, she'd be sold to a house of ill repute. But there were only two professions for women during that time. You were either a wife or you sold your body for a living. There was no third option. And since poverty was rampant, most girls were not wives. Finish your balls. I paid your father's good money for you. The brothels will pay me even more once you get some curve on you skinny country nothings. Eat! Pardon me, folks, that's a mistake. I meant to say that most girls were not sold as brides to wealthy lords. But Mizu, in spite of everything that was going against her, was determined to get revenge. Like Beatrix Kiddo, she was on the hunt for the men responsible for violating her mother. The problem is, the four white men she's after have powerful connections to the Japanese ruling class, as well as the criminal underground. In other words, they're heavily protected. And because she's a woman, a biracial woman, she has to do all of this while keeping her ethnicity and gender concealed. Yeah, great story indeed. And now that you know what the show is about and what I like about it, I gotta talk about the things that bother me, where it loses me. First of all, it's horrifically woke. It's wall-to-wall -wall feminist rage corn. And in every episode, you get a heavy dose of the message. You want sugar when there are proper options. More, more than a few lords have taken notice of you and inquired. Lord Saito's wife died in childbirth and he needs a new bride. He's an old man and a drunk and a monger. Lord Saito earns a hundred thousand koku. Is that your price for me? If I don't marry you off, you'll end up in a line with him anyway. So would you rather be his wife or his whore? Under the law, revenge is a luxury for men. Women like me must be practical. You're determined to resent me when what you resent is being someone else's property. Women shouldn't be property. Well, they are. And tomorrow you go from your father's to Master Takayoshi's. We've been servicing the road-weary crotches of every man here to pay obeisance to your new family. You need only service one freshly washed. You don't understand that he's a beast. He's weak. He's a man. All men are weak. The ones who act beastly are weakest. They penetrate women and think that makes them powerful. Really, their p***s are fragile, exposed. You saw it yourself. They want to be diapered, spanked, and breastfed, then strut away like they conquered an army. Nurture his weakness, be his strength, and he'll worship you. I don't know if I can. Stop running to and from men and decide what you want for your f***ing self. I want to be in control of my life. Then take control of his. Princess. You breathed your first breath because of me, and you breathe now because I allow it. A son is needed. For once in my life, I call on a daughter. Ah! Seki, what is this? Akemi is coming with me, if she wishes. You came back for me. I did what I thought was best for you, and it was never for me to decide. Can you forgive me, child? All these years at my side, to throw your life away today for a daughter. You breathe now, because I allow it. Saki, no. He wanted me to be free, away from my life, from royalty, all of it. Akemi, he was right. We found each other again. I don't care about any of this anymore. I just want to be a man with you. We could be happy. Come. Seki didn't tell me to run. He told me to do what I want. We should stay. We don't have to. I don't need to be great. I just want to be happy. 
I want to be great. Good grief. Again, that's in every episode, several times an episode. It's either a call for women's empowerment or a monologue on how men are pathetic, and it never stops. You're sitting there enjoying the show, loving the dialogue and the blood splatter, then all of a sudden, boom, it's telling you why you and your peen are the bane of human existence. It's right up there where Amazon primes the power in terms of its hatred of males. And if you want to hear more about that show, check out this video. It's a collaboration I did with Dr. Tia San Johnson. But it's frustrating because it's not a bad show. To the contrary, it's really good. It's not like watching one of those stupid MCU or Star Wars projects where you get misandry and a bad story. Unlike that garbage, Blue-Eyed Samurai is entertaining. And the show follows a theme that we see often when it comes to female protagonists. Masculine men, bad. Submissive men, good. There are eight men featured in the show, but there are two in particular that bother me. The first being Ringo, Mizo's fat, oafish apprentice with no hands, who ironically aspires to be a samurai. Every female protagonist in a girl power project has to have a beta male sidekick. In Star Wars, it was Finn. In Captain Marvel, it was Nick Fury. In Echo, it's Biscuits. And in Blue-Eyed Samurai, it's Ringo, who's essentially Mizu's wife and that he cooks for her, cleans after her, and tends to her wounds. Now in all fairness, he does have his heroic moments. He does rescue her on multiple occasions, and she depends on him for help. And he also acts in the way of her moral conscience, and occasionally check her when she's being too self-centered. So he's a very lovable character, I'm just tired of the shtick. But the most disgusting man in the show has to be Mizu's husband, Mikio who was a well-established, highly successful horse trainer for a local lord. And we meet him through a series of flashbacks. And the show leads you to believe he's a good man. Because prior to his introduction, every man that Mizu meets is a brute. And he, Mikio, goes out of his way to prove that he isn't. And in the beginning, Mizu is distant, unloving, and cold towards her husband. They don't even sleep together. And you have to understand, during that time, men had the legal right to force themselves on their wives. But Mikio never does. Instead, Mikio romances Mizu, and she builds an attraction and trust towards him. And not only do we begin to see Mizu open up, but she begins to soften and become more ladylike. And the two go on a whirlwind romance. Now I'm thinking, okay, this is too good to be true. Something tragic must have happened. He must have died because we don't see him in the show. Again, we only see him through flashbacks. But actually, something worse happens. You wanted to be a man? I had to live as one. Also, the men who were after you couldn't find you. And so I could have my revenge against the man who made me this way. A monster. I want to see all of you, not who your mother wants you to pretend to be. All I did was train with a sword. Show me. So everything between Mizu and her husband Mikio was going great, until they had a duel. I've never faced a Naginata. A bit old-fashioned, but no better weapon when outnumbered in battle. Don't worry, we can start slow. Ready? Don't hold back. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Unsheath it. Show me your blade. I don't want to hurt you. Okay, that's enough. Did you also lose your backbone when you lost your title? She beat him. She downright embarrasses him. And from that point forward, he resents her. And in the next scene, 
we see Mizu trying to save the relationship. She's dolling herself up trying to look pretty for her husband when swordsmen arrive. And for some reason, they're looking for Mizu. There's a bounty on her head. And we're led to believe that it was her husband who alerted them to their whereabouts. And while the men close in to attack Mizu, she sees Mikio looking from a distance. And she thinks he's there to save her. But instead he turns away, forcing her to face her attackers alone. And she prevails. But immediately after the fight is over, he comes begging for her forgiveness. Saying that it wasn't him who alerted the henchmen. And that he ran away to get a weapon. In either case, she doesn't believe him. And she ends up deleting him. And that's the men of the show. Now, I don't have a problem with men being villains in a movie or show, but in The Blue-Eyed Samurai, every masculine man in the show has a problem with Mizu. Her only male allies are men who are submissive to her. Even with Taigen, who is a very capable warrior, she humbles him on two occasions. So if I had to describe the show, I would say it's a combination of Samurai Jack, Mulan, Kill Bill, with a heavy dose of the color purple. I'm not exaggerating, I almost expected Oprah Winfrey and Kathleen Kennedy's names to pop up in the credits. But even still, it's a really good show. And speaking of the credits, I had to look up the people who made it, because there's no way it was made in Japan. Japanese people take pride in their culture, and there's no way they'd produce a hit piece against their men or their culture. And sure enough, it was made by two Americans, a man named Michael Green and his half-Asian wife, Amber Noizumi. And it was produced by a company out of France. And they say it was inspired by the birth of their daughter, whom they affectionately call their blue-eyed samurai. Even Noizumi herself, who is half Japanese, admits she knows very little of Japanese culture. Quoting, I wanted to explore feeling in between two worlds, but the only world I knew was the world in which I tried to assimilate with mostly white people. So again, Noizumi is a Western woman, a modern woman, a non-traditional woman, trying to write a story from the perspective of women living in 17th century Japan, which is impossible for someone like her to do, because women like Amber Noizumi only exist in societies where feminism can thrive, and feminism can only thrive in nations like America, where there is extreme wealth, because there's a system in place that protects women and grants them privileges and advantages that allows them to live a life free from men. But without that system of protection and privileges, women would have to rely exclusively on men. And in most societies, now and throughout the history of the world, where people live hand to mouth, where poverty is rampant and governments are dysfunctional, that's the reality. And 17th century Japan was one of those places. So a woman born in that culture, under those circumstances, would be nothing like Mizu or Akimi, the lead characters in Blue-Eyed Samurai. They wouldn't be bold and outspoken, nor would they be confrontational towards their men or try to live a life absent from them. Women back then were living in a world where war was constant, disease was common, and food was not a given. Just waking up the next day was a blessing, and there were too many struggles for them to be worried about having equal rights. They were just glad to have men, men who were willing to share their resources with them and protect them. And that's my biggest issue with the show. The characters, though well-developed, didn't fit the culture of the environment they were set in. Mizu and Akimi act like American women trapped in an isekai anime. For those who don't know what that means, it's like they slipped into an interdimensional time portal that took them from modern-day America to 17th century Japan. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there weren't heroic women back in the day, but they weren't fighting against their own men. It reminds me of that stupid medieval Me Too movie that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck made several years ago called The Last Duel. Hollywood loves to create what I call activist period pieces to make it seem like their ideology isn't exclusive to the world we live in today. So they create these false narratives to co-op history to their cause, in this case, feminism. So why am I talking about this? Why did I make this long video dedicated to pointing out progressive messaging in the series, instead of just focusing on how awesome the show is? Because that's the consensus opinion. Every channel I've seen is giving it high praise, which it does deserve, by the way, because it is a really good show. Well, it's the theme of my channel. 
Entertainment media is more than entertainment, it's propaganda through art. The stories may be fake, but the messages behind the stories are always real. For good or bad, better or worse, the goal is to influence your mind, challenge your way of thinking to affect culture. Pointing out progressive messaging in media is what I do here. Secondly, I want to hammer home the fact that Blue-Eyed Samurai is not anime. Because anime doesn't come with an agenda. Now, that doesn't mean it's free from messaging. All media has messaging. Going back to the theme of the channel, anime is entertainment media, and entertainment media is propaganda through art. They all, I repeat, all have messages, and the messages are always real, but they aren't always bad or counterculture. So when I say anime isn't woke or agenda-driven, I'm saying it's not like Lucas Films or Marvel Studios. I like to make men uncomfortable. I enjoy <laughs> making men uncomfortable. <laughs> Shut up, bitch. And anime doesn't engage in that kind of foolishness. They don't reboot a popular series with gender or race swapped characters. For example, Funimation didn't decide to make Goku a non-binary person of color in Dragon Ball Super, nor that they reinterpret the relationship between Piccolo and Gohan for modern audiences. And Chi-Chi is still a housewife. She didn't rise to become the most powerful warrior in Universe 7. And speaking of female protagonists in anime, there are plenty of them whose powers even exceed the men around them. But they don't propagate misandry or champion feminist talking points. Mikasa doesn't tell Eren to check his privilege. Annie doesn't tell Armin that she's a better scout than he is because she's a woman. And Historia, even though she's the queen, doesn't slam her coochie on the table and tell Commander Eren how to run the scout regiment. And they don't shy away from giving women the business. Women, you're entirely too weak. I mean, just look at you. You have no endurance. You anger too easily. And you've got woman troubles. Just more proof that women don't belong in a man's war. You know nothing about women. Of course not. I'm a man. How would I know? <sighs> but what I do know is that we can't afford to be held up by your female problems. Or anything else for that matter. Understand? The enemy doesn't care about your condition. Or whether or not you're a woman. Actually, on second thought, they might be happy about that. Now, there are animes dedicated to the empowerment of women and girls, and there are anime that highlight rainbow romances. Because anime is a wide spectrum of genres, there's a niche for everything and everyone. But they allow men to have their spaces. Now, to their credit, the creators of the series, Michael Green and Amber Noizumi, have gone on record saying that while they are fans of anime, and that the show is heavily inspired by anime. Their show, Blue-Eyed Samurai, is not anime. And before I close, I'd like to add one final point. Woke messaging, progressive messaging, liberal social commentary have always been a part of entertainment media. But traditionally, it's done through a series of subtle or subliminal metaphors or allegories. And the purpose was to make you think or consider whatever it is they were pushing. And they made sure that their message never interfered with the narrative. Back in the day, you didn't walk away from a movie thinking more about the message than you did the plot. And that's the brilliance behind movies like Star Wars. Most people saw it as a film about heroes fighting against an evil empire, when in reality it was an editorial against US actions in the Vietnam War. The rebels fighting against the empire were the Viet Cong. You did something very interesting with Star Wars, if you think about it. The good guys are the rebels. They're using asymmetric warfare against a highly organized empire. I think we call those guys terrorists today. We call them Mujahideen, we call them Al-Qaeda. When I did it, they were Viet Cong. Exactly. So were you thinking of that at the time? Yes. So it was a very anti-authoritarian, very kind of 60s, against the man kind of thing. And on the flip side, you have Lord of the Rings. Its creator, John R.R. R. Tolkien, was a devout Christian. And the entire story is a metaphor of spiritual warfare. The people who enjoyed that movie thought it was just an action-adventure fantasy, when in reality, they were getting the gospel. And that's my criticism of Blue-Eyed Samurai. It lacks the subtlety of the aforementioned projects. The show is great, but the message is too loud. So I'm going to close things here. But before I do, please be sure to check out the other videos in my library as I'm sure there's something there you'll enjoy. And if you like this video, please share the link on your social media platforms, as I cannot stress enough how far that goes into helping me grow the channel. 
And that's it. That's all I have to say about it. What do you have to say about it? Leave a comment in the comment section and let's have a conversation. Now I'm sure you've heard me say this a million times. So if you like this video, give it a like and leave a comment in the comment section and share the link on your social media platforms. I cannot stress enough how far that goes. And Hell! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! And while I do appreciate you liking, sharing, subbing, and leaving comments, I'm going to ask that you help me go another step further in helping me grow the channel. I set up a membership program for those of you who'd like to offer additional support in the development of this channel. It's not anything expensive or special, it's just 99 cents a month, which is enough for me to continue doing the work that I do here. Help me! Help me! Help me! In the future, there will be additional tiers with added benefits, but right now I need your support so I can cover basic costs. So please, sign up so I can continue giving you awesome content. This is The Layman's Journal. I'm out.